Yeah. Yeah. Remember me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, I would like to welcome Dr. David James to the University of Central Arkansas Society of Physics Students 2015-2016 seminar series. Uh, this seminar series is funded and supported by the Department of Physics and Astronomy and the University of Central Arkansas Foundation. Uh, here we have a small grant that helps us support the seminar series. Uh, Dr. James is going to be giving a presentation today. That's the wrong one. I saved it and it's the wrong one. Shoot. So Dr. James is going to be giving a presentation today on cosmic dust. Um, he is a calibration engineer at the uh, University of Colorado Impact Laboratory. Um, David James is also a uh, 2002 graduate of the University of Central Arkansas Department of Physics. So you guys are basically looking forward in time and he is looking backwards in time. So, Dr. James, please take it your seminar. All right. Well, thank you very much, Will. You're um, very let me share this real quick, and I think we'll get going. So, as Will said, I um, I'll talk a little bit about where I work. Uh, but yeah, I graduated from UCA in uh, 2002, and very soon after, came to the University of Colorado. Um, I actually did an REU here, if you know what that is. It's a research experience for undergraduates. While I was at UCA, really enjoyed it and decided to come back and been here ever since. So uh, what I do is I study cosmic dust in all of its glory. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about where I work, uh, and then I'll introduce you to the exciting world of cosmic dust. And we actually have a, an accelerator here where we use to simulate this dust in space in our laboratory. I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'll show you briefly show you some experiments we've done. And then I'll talk about some space missions for our lab, which is kind of what I think is the really, really exciting part, um, which include SDC, which is on New Horizons. Um, if you saw in the news recently, Pluto, on July 14th, we had our closest approach there. LDEX, which is a little bit lesser known, but a very successful um, mission around the moon. And then the upcoming Europa mission, uh, we have an instrument selected on there, SUDA. So I'll talk about those three specifically um, as the space missions. And I also want to say, um, it's very strange not to be able to see you guys, but whatever. Um, I'll also say if you have any questions at any point, you can just start shouting and then I'll stop and we can go back to the regular one. I'm happy to answer them during the presentation if, if you would like. So this is, I, I actually work at LASP, or the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. And it's kind of one of those things where you have a a meme of where, you know, this is where people think I work, this is where my mom thinks I work, and this is where I actually work. So I technically work at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, um, which is a research institute of CU Boulder. Um, it is, it started in 1948, so it's actually older than NASA. Um, it started with a different name, but that's where we um, have our beginnings. And we started out with UV. So uh, we, we, we got our start in the upper atmosphere looking at the ultraviolet light from the sun, or Lyman Alpha is, is mainly where we were doing that. And we had a lot of success, and so when they sent these early missions to Mars, to Venus, um, they actually asked us to make some of the, the cameras to go on there, or the uh, spectrometers. And so we had a long history with uh, ultraviolet imaging spectrometers, or um, just ultraviolet imaging in general, um, uh, building up to where we are today. Uh, I actually worked on the IEVS on MAVEN, which is one that's going around Mars. I helped calibrate that um, over a variety of temperature ranges. Uh, but now LASP does a lot more than UV, which is where we got our start. Um, the Kepler, if you've heard of that mission, um, it's the one that's looking for planets. So if you see um, people say, hey, look, we found another planet, there's a good chance that Kepler is the one doing that, that found that planet. Um, so we have the mission operations for that. Uh, which is the um, which is controlling the spacecraft. We also worked on MMS, or the Magneto Multiscale multi Experiment, and we have some magnetometers on that, so now we do electric fields and magnetics, um, and then we do a lot more than that, but I'll focus on cosmic dust, which is what I study in the lab that I work at studies. So, uh, this is a brief history of LASP and its missions. We've actually sent a mission to everywhere in the solar system, um, and we're one of the few that's done that if you include Pluto. Uh, we, there's another one, JPL, who has that claim just recently. 
um, but we're one of the few who's worked on a mission to every um, every object in the solar system, every planet in the solar system, like I said, including Pluto. Uh, there's about four or five here that I'll work on. Um, I won't point them out, but it's just to say the last is a long history of these missions, and it's kind of exciting to be a part of it. So this is where I actually work. It's the Institute for Modeling Plasmas, Atmospheres, and Cosmic Dust, which happens to have a cool acronym, IMPACT. Um, so, why IMPACT? Well, because our second choice acronym, the Universal Comic As Cosmic <laughs> Asteroid, or UCA, it was already taken, so it goes IMPACT. Um, and, because that's what we do. Uh, we model and study uh, cosmic dust, like I said, in all its glory. Um, these are a couple... Um, of the cool shots that I've seen recently from uh, things that involve cosmic dust, we uh, people I work with or have a mission on uh, have an instrument on Cassini, which in, um, discovered the Enceladus plumes out at um, Enceladus, which is where this water is shooting up from the bottom. You fly through the ice, and uh, we actually discovered those with that instrument. Um, on the right, you can see an eruption from Io, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but it's really hard to see. There's a, a red dot on there, and that's actually a volcano erupting on this moon, and then you can see the dust elevating above that, and that's the blue light that the sun lights up as it comes across, um, and you actually get cosmic dust that way. So this is our core team, and I want to show this slide because I think it's, it's really kind of an interesting aspect of where I work. We have eight permanent staff and we have 20 students. So we employ a lot of students and it's basically my full-time job now is to help them um, with all of their experiments and kind of um, show them how everything works and someday hopefully have them uh, operate the accelerator uh, and do their own research. Um, but we're very heavily student-based. Um, anywhere from we actually hire some high school students all the way up to graduate um, students. We have one postdoc right now, the guy on the bottom left, but other than that, it's mostly grads and undergrads. So, dust in the vacuum of space. Uh, so first of all, dust is everywhere. In fact, that's how it got its name. Uh, when people first started looking through telescopes, they saw this stuff that was just everywhere. It's kind of like on your, um, in your bedroom, you just, you just can't get rid of it. It's everywhere, you try to wipe off your lens and it's just everywhere. So that's how, <laughs> that's why people started calling this dust. Um, it is very small, it's about the size of dust, and like I said, it's everywhere. Uh, that's what gives the, the nebula a lot of their uh, flavor. So in here you can see some hot gases in the middle, but most of the nebula is uh, cosmic dust. Um, out in the Orion, Orion Nebula and all these other ones, the Horsehead and all these, um, have a lot of dust in them. It turns out that shooting stars, uh, you probably already know this, Dr. Meta, um, who I believe is still there, does some uh, work on meteors. But it's really just cosmic dust entering our atmosphere and burning up. And these meteors that burn up, that don't make it, are really small. They're actually, the biggest ones are about the size of a grain of rice. Um, that's a pretty big shooting star. Um, they're obviously much bigger, but those are quite rare. Uh, so shooting stars are dust. It's just dust that's entering our atmosphere and burning up. Um, comets have a lot of uh, dust, and they're, they're going very fast. So in, and this translates to um, the, the dust behind the comet going very fast. So this is a shot of Halley's Comet as it fly, flew close to the sun. You can see all this stuff that's shedding off of it. Uh, this is taken by the Giotto spacecraft. Uh, and I talked a little bit of, about this, but Io is a moon of Jupiter, and it has um, it's very, very active. And Galileo, back in the 80s and 90s, um, discovered this dust stream. And what was happening was these volcanoes were erupting, and the dust, these really small particles, less than a micron size, will get swept up in this moving magnetic field, which is an electric field, and they get accelerated to these very, very high speeds. Um, in this case, up to 300 kilometers per second. So, you know, from uh, Conway to Fayetteville, Arkansas, in about a second. So it's very, very, very fast. And that's what we study are these small but very fast moving particles in space. So if you're an alien looking outside on our solar system, uh, on the left shows you uh, the solar system as our, uh, and what you'd see from the dust footprint. It shows Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, and Neptune, the outer four planets. And imagine, look on the right, you can't see those planets. This is actually just an updated view, but imagine you can't see those planets. If you're an alien looking in, you'll see all this dust and you'll say, wow, that's interesting. There's, there's an asymmetry in the, in the dust. And what that'll tell you is that there's a planet there. And so from this arrangement of the dust, um, you can look at other solar systems and you can say, wow, there's probably a planet here. There's probably a planet there. 
Um, this is actually fixed in the frame of Neptune. And if you fix it in the frame of uh, Uranus or Jupiter, you'll see a similar lobe gather around those planets. So this is interesting in that it tells you where these planets are if you're looking on the outside. Um, it also is very interesting because astronauts, that's why the astronauts have spacesuits made of Kevlar, is to protect them from these micrometeoroids. This is actually a, um, an impact on the Endeavour um, shuttle. Uh, back in the 90s, I believe. It was quite a while ago. But this is uh, one of them that hit the radiators. And you can see this uh, was probably produced by a one to two diameter particle and it created about a quarter inch size hole and this thing went um, all the way through the radiator. Uh, so there's, there's a big safety concern when you look at dust near Earth for these astronauts and the International Space Station. And if you ever go to Mars, um, what's the dust population out at Mars? Um, so that all these um, reasons, that the, the cosmic dust is, um, is why we study it and why it's important. Uh, this is a scaling law near Earth. So you can see that the smaller particles are much, much, much more numerous. If you look at the bottom, that is the diameter of the particle in microns. So at the far right, you have 1,000 microns, which is about a millimeter. And you can see that if, and this is the cumulative flux over a meter squared per year. So you take a meter squared, you take it up to the, the stratosphere, you let it sit there, and you look at how many particles pass through that meter, and that's what's going on here. So you have only about 0.01 particles, so it takes you 10 years, or sorry, 100 years to get um, a millimeter-sized particle through that uh, meter squared. It just turns out that the Earth is so big that on um, meteor showers we see a lot of these. But if you go up to one micron, now all of a sudden there's about 10,000 per year through this meter squared. So our job is to study the small stuff and then infer from that the, what the larger stuff is doing. So uh, that's what we do. Let's get dusty here on Earth. We have um, we know kind of what these particles look like. Uh, this is a picture, an SEM picture, of three different types of particles. Uh, on the far left, this was captured by a U-2 uh, spacecraft, uh, sorry, um, airplane in the stratosphere and brought back down. So this is very fluffy dust. On the right, you have actual lunar dust um, taken by somebody in our lab. Uh, and you can see that that's a different variety. Um, we have the ability to shoot a lot of these particles. And I'll talk about what it means to shoot them. Um, but well, and then it, down below it shows uh, some of what we shoot. So we a lot of times shoot this iron dust, which, which is kind of typical of meteors, and we shoot it in little spheres. Um, actually, work, I actually remember working with uh, Carl Fredrickson over there, and what I did was study these glass spheres. And so whenever I look at this, it always reminds me of those uh, little glass spheres I studied at UCA. Um, th so this is a very small scale. You can see that each one of these has five. Well. Um, on the lunar dust, it's got a micron marked and uh, five microns for the other one. So they're very small. They're about, you know, five or ten microns each. And just to give you a scale, human hair fits about the width of this page. Uh, and the relative speeds of these are typically on the order of kilometers per second. So one to a hundred is what we study uh, in our accelerator. So our accelerator. This is a picture of um, our lab, the main piece of equipment in our lab. You can see at the bottom left, uh, there's some computer screens for size. So this is about 10 meters across, or about 40 feet. Um, the particle, which is obviously not scale, starts on the right. Uh, that's a 3 megavolt Pelotron accelerator. Um, and we, we, we give it a little kick of uh, 20 kilovolts, and then it sees this 3 million volts and gets shot out the end. It goes through a couple steering mechanisms, and then it hits the first detector. Actually, it doesn't hit the first detector. It flies through the first detector, um, and we measure that. So that's the blue line. So this was a particle that was traveling about 2.61 kilometers per second, um, and it had a mass. Uh, let me talk in radius. It was about a 0.75 micron particle. So this particle is coming out of the accelerator at 2, two kilometers per second, and it's a very, very small particle. So it enters detector one. We look at that. And we make sure that it actually enters detector two because anywhere along this path, you only have a centimeter aperture that you can go through. And if you deviate from that at all, you just explode into a billion pieces in your life. Your thrill rad is done if you're a dust particle. Um, but for this one, fortunately, it made it all the way. So what we do is we pass through the first detector, the second detector, which is the green one. And then during the time it takes to get from the green to the red, which is our gate, it's an electrostatic gate that we shut off, we calculate is that a particle that we want? Is that a micron-sized particle? Or what are we doing today in this particular experiment? And do we want this particle? And so if it is, we open the gate, 
what you can see is the red pulse actually opening our gate and we let it through. If not, we leave the gate closed and it just, again, gets obliterated into a billion pieces and we've lost it. Um, but this one made it through and it also made it through the final detector right before our chamber. So this particle um, started at the accelerator, went all the way through detector one, detector two. It was for this particular test, it was one that we wanted. So we let it through the gate and made it through detector three and it made it all the way to our instrument that we were testing in there at the time. So, and that's our testing chamber at the very end. I'll show another picture of that. Um, and obviously any cool lab has to have a red clock. So we have one of those. Uh, this is our, um, the masses of the particles that we are interested in and their speeds. So the, there's something out at Ames, which is another NASA center uh, that has the light gas gun and they do a lot bigger particles, but a little bit slower. So the green line, and so you have the speed on the bottom and the log of the mass on the left. And I've included a few cheat sheets. So at the top, you have a few millimeters. In the middle, you have a few microns. And at the bottom, you have a few nanometers. So we typically measure in the few microns to a few nanometer size. And our speeds are about 1 to 100 kilometers per second. And what we do with this is we measure these small micrometeoroids, interstellar dust, and also some of this nano dust that's coming off the IO or the beta, meter, beta meteoroids. And all that is is things that are affected by the sun. Um, so this is kind of our bread and butter, what we are aiming to simulate in the lab with our electrostatic accelerator. This is our testing chamber. So you were looking on it from above earlier. Now you're looking at it from the side in a much more human type scale. Uh, we, what we do is that door opens um, and we put our test piece, whether it be the student dust counter or LDAX or SUDA or just some piece of uh, mirror that we want to test or a solar cell or whatever we're looking at at the time and we impact it with particles and we see the response or we take it out and look at an SEM, whatever we're doing at that time. But this is our testing chamber where the particles eventually hit our instrument. So some of the laboratory experiments that we are doing um, or we have done. So one of the first things, this is actually one that I did and we have these detectors that go into space. So imagine you are an instrument and you're looking at light. Well, typically you have a mirror or you have a lens and it's exposed to this dust. As you travel through the solar system, there's a lot of dust and it will impact your, um, your lens or your mirror. Or in this case, it's an electron multiplier. And basically all that is, is it's, it, it detects either ions or electrons or photons um, very, very sensitively. So this was one of our, ion, our electron multipliers that we put in our tank. And then we shot dust on it. We shot this very small but very fast moving dust on it. And we looked at the craters that it caused and we said, wow, does this actually damage our detector? Because in space, we will be ex exposed to this. Um, so this is a few pictures of what we see. Uh, this actually, this bottom right one was pretty interesting. It was a double particle that stuck together somehow, made it through and then uh, created this little uh, impact uh, crater. Uh, and it turns out that we, it didn't really affect us that much. Uh, so this instrument will survive when we put it into space, which is good because this is the one, this is the detector that's proposed on the uh, Europa mission, which will launch in 2020. Um, so this was a, a good verification that will actually survive. Uh, one of the cool things we've done recently is um, ice impact. So it's actually really hard to grow ice in a vacuum. Um, if you put water inside of your vacuum, you typically don't have a vacuum anymore. It, um, it, you know, you get up to maybe a Militor or, or, uh, or something like that. So it's really hard to keep it at a very low vacuum, let's say 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 6 Tor, um, and still have ice. But we've managed to do that. Um, on the upper right is a picture of that experiment. And on that upper right photo, to the left, you see a red piece. That's actually Kapton. And right in the center is our ice. Um, we have another little lamp that we're not using on the far side, but um, that is a, a picture of our little fuzzy ice that we have grown in vacuum. And so what we do is we shine a laser on that and we use it as an interferometer, which is the bottom picture. And it shows you as you leak water into this, so we make that, that target very, very cold. Uh, we flood it with liquid nitrogen. Um, <laughs> that's another thing I remember enjoying doing at UCA was messing around with liquid nitrogen. Um, but um, we, we, put we take that to liquid nitrogen temperatures and then we leak water in very slowly. And it, these fringes are you watching the ice grow over time. And so as, as you release the water inside the vacuum, um, it collects on the cold places. And so you actually form this film of ice 
as you leak water in. Uh, this takes about uh, a few hours to do, um, and uh, but it's, it's a very controlled, but at the end, we know very precisely how much water we have on there. Um, so that's how we grow this ice, and then we shoot on it. This is an ice spectra. So what we've done here is, I, I'm gonna go back one slide, I'm sorry. So uh, we shoot ice into this chamber, which is hooked to the back of our big chamber that I just showed. Uh, this guy, oh, it's gonna be crazy. So we put it on the back of this, and then we um, use this chamber as a pass-through. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit crazy. So there we go. Um, and then we shoot ice into here, and then we have a time of flight mass spectrometer, which basically says, what type of um, elements do you have coming off of this high energy, high energy impact? So imagine for a second, there's a, something called the miller ure experiment, where a guy took, um, or Miller and Ure took um, uh, a, a vial of uh, primitive um, elements that you find in the early, uh, early Earth, and he put energy into it. He put lightning, basically. And he said, you know, after a while, he just let it sit for there, let it sit there under these conditions, and you actually form these amino acids. Um, and and what that showed was that from simply these simple um, elements plus a lot of energy, you can actually form the building blocks for life. So now imagine that that energy comes from other places. Well, let's say a, a high energy impact experiment uh, from cosmic dust, and that's one of the theories that you know, possibly how life uh, started as well, is maybe at a moon of uh, Jupiter, Europa, Callisto, um, Ganymede, one of these, um, uh, a particle with a carbon or something came in with a very high energy and you can create this, um, possibly the building blocks for life here. So, <laughs> that's kind of one of the experiments we're hoping to do down the road. Um, but this is a spectra from one of those impacts. So we have an, a particle coming in, it impacts our ice that we have just grown, and we look at the elements coming off and the molecules. It turns out in this one, you get a lot of molecules. And what you see are these clustering of water, which is obvious, right? You have, um, you're growing water, so you expect to see water get obliterated off, off of this. Um, you can also see some other things, sodium, this, which is Na and potassium. And you can see some Na and OH, some, um, some other more complicated molecules forming. And this ice spectra was very important to us because we saw with Cassini, a very, very similar thing out at um, Enceladus. And so this ice spectra basically gave us a calibration for what we were seeing in space with the cosmic dust experiment um, out at uh, Enceladus. And from there, they said, yes, absolutely what we're seeing at Enceladus is water ice. And that's one of the, the, one of the ways that they know that Enceladus has these water plumes that are shooting up. Um, so this was kind of a, a, a good calibration for us in the lab. Uh, we also do shooting stars for lack of a better word. Uh, this is a chamber um, that we hook to the back of that um, experimental uh, tank as well, and we leak gas in. So it turns out another hard thing to do is have a, to, to put one of these particles inside of um, a high pressure, well, high pressure being about a thousand times less than atmosphere, or 10,000 times less than atmosphere, um, into one of those. Because if you, if you shoot it into gas, it burns up. And so if you fill your, your your dust column with gas, your acceleration column with gas, and you'll burn it up before you ever get it to your um, to your uh, experiment. And so what we do here is we put little tiny apertures on the end of this guy. You can see something with a red cap. There's a, a turbo pump that goes on top of that, and that pumps out air. And then we put we actually force air to go in the last stage of this, and we make it a, a sort of a high pressure. And we look at how the uh, particles when they enter that high pressure, which again is only 10,000 times less than atmosphere instead of a billion, um, and how they burn up. So we're actually looking at these little shooting stars inside the laboratory. He's actually hooking up a PMT, which is a very, very sensitive um, um, device for measuring light. So what do we see with this? Um, and it's kind of obvious, but we are actually seeing with these PMTs um, particles burning up. And we have a lot of uh, goals in this. The radar people who look at um, meteors coming in they can tell you about how big the signal was, but they don't really know how to relate that back to the size of the particle. So that's what we're doing in this, is we're working with the radar people to kind of say, this is the influx into the Earth. Um, so on this graph, you have uh, really the amount of light coming off is the vertical axis. So the taller those blue bars, the more light coming off. And then from left to right, you have it entering the experimental chamber um, and then exiting, uh, not exiting, actually smashes the wall at the very end, but um, you have the end of the tube at the right. And so you can see, 
just as you would expect for a shooting star, you have a lot of light and then actually it dies off. And we're not 100% sure why that is. There could be two reasons. One of them is you could have basically ablated so your particle no longer exists. You've, um, you've burned it up. Or it could be that it actually slows down in this, um, in this gas. And so um, when it slows down, you don't have as much um, charge being stripped off. Uh, but this is one of the early results from that, um, our shooting star experiment. So uh, now let's send something into space. So that's actually how I got my start here at the University of Colorado, was calibrating these instruments that go into space. Um, and I got my start on two, in 2004, soon after I graduated from UCA, um, at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics on the student dust counter, which is on the New Horizons mission, um, and that's the one that recently was at Pluto. So SDC's journey, um, it launched in 2006, uh, and I'll show you a picture of the launch and a few other things about that. Uh, from Earth, it did a flyby of Jupiter in 2007. This is actually an old plot, but it flew by in uh, February of 2007. Um, and then recently, it flew by Pluto and Charon and Nix and Hydra um, in 2015, in July 14th of 2015. And this was, in fact, our, our slogan at the time, because. Um, Pluto got demoted as a planet in June, I believe, of 2006. And so when we launched, Pluto was still a planet. And so our slogan at the time was the first mission to the last planet. Um, and then that kind of changed. But and, and it was actually really funny. People said, well, are you going to bring it back? Or you know, are you still going to do it? And we're like, well, yeah, we kind of launched. And it's still a pretty important object in the solar system. Um, but yeah, so it was uh, right about the time that we launched was all that controversy. So it was kind of interesting to our little crew who was working on this. Um, but what I was saying was, it's kind of the, the first mission to that outer Kuiper Belt region. Um, we explored the gas giants with the uh, Voyagers and uh, Pioneers and the Rocky Planets with some of the uh, Mariners. Um, this is kind of the first step into the outer region of the solar system. And it's a long way. So if you were a power walker and you were going to, do, to uh, Pluto, um, roughly anybody can answer, how long do you think it would take you? If you're going to Pluto and you were walking, what was it? Uh, I would say like 30,000 years. You are very, very close. 200,000 years. So, I mean, you could have said a billion, you could have said five. So, it's a very long <laughs> way. If you were to fly, <laughs> I'm talking about order of magnitude decimal here, so that's good. If you were to fly, it would still take you a thousand years. And we were the fastest thing ever launched from Earth, and it still took us nine and a half years. Um, most of our journey, we averaged about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers per second. Uh, like I said, Jupiter gave us a little kick, um, but we're still actually not more than 10, so it was about 15 to 20 kilometers per second. It still took us nine and a half years to get there. So imagine where you'll be in nine years. I mean, I, was a, I just started my graduate career, and I was like, I have no clue where I'll be. Uh, maybe I'll be in Asia or something like that. Um, and so it was this really interesting uh, time for me to work on this project that's so far out. But, you know, it turns out that I'm still here, which is kind of cool. So most of the, the instruments on that mission focused on Pluto. However, SDC, the student dust counter, which I worked on, focused on the dust along the way. And I showed this plot earlier. But imagine that you're New Horizons and you're starting in the very, very center and you're going out to Pluto. Well, you'll fly through all this dust and what you hope to see. And so our instrument, as you impact um, the, uh, there's these detectors on there, we send a signal, we get a signal. And then we store that um, during hibernation where most of the spacecraft is off. And then when we wake up, we send it back to Earth. And so that um, is our, uh, was our prime mission or our prime time was when all the other spacecraft instruments were asleep waiting to get to Pluto. Uh, this is the spacecraft inside of the fairing or the, um, the very top of the, the rocket. That's Alan Stern, the principal investigator. And you can see at the top, uh, there, so the spacecraft is gold. Um, and what that actually is, is it's MLI. It's a blanket, so it doesn't get too cold. But our instrument is actually the, um, the silver part with the uh, 12 little box looking things hanging off of there. And that flies in the direction of the, the spacecraft, and so we're moving at about 15 kilometers per second, impacting the small dust. We get those signals, and they send it back to Earth. Um, very quickly, I won't spend too much time on this, but the overall idea is that a particle hits us, again, going very fast, about the spacecraft speed, or 15 kilometers per second, um, creates this uh, depolarization cavity, blah, 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 but it is a signal, and the size of that signal 
is related to the mass. So the bigger the signal, the bigger the particle that hit us. And that's really what's important to us. And also we know where it occurred because we know where the spacecraft was. So as we go throughout, this, oh, I forgot to have this. Um, so I, in the early stages, I was actually um, helping to build these things. So it's a student project, which is um, one of the fascinating things about this particular one was it was built and still run by students. So I don't really work on it anymore because it's passed to the next generation of students. Um, but this is me working on building one of the, uh, the detectors that you saw there. Uh, they're about the size of a dollar bill, um, and they're, they're about that flimsy, too. They're really, really lightweight. Uh, this is a, um, the red tag cover, so that's about how big our instrument was. Uh, and actually, uh, I'm going to do something really quick. I'm going to go back to me, I think. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I think. Yeah. And I'll show you the red tag cover that we have. So this is a picture of that. So this is the actual cover that went on the spacecraft. And if you've ever flown, um, if you've ever been a pilot, or if you've ever watched any of the launches, anything red comes off the spacecraft. So this guy um, was painted red so that they didn't launch with it. Um, but this was the one that, that uh, covered the, the, the detectors so they wouldn't get dusty, which is ironic because that's what we're detecting, um, before, uh, before launch. Um, so that's about the size of it, and um, it's kind of cool. Pretty awesome. yeah. uh, I actually have a picture while I'm all oh, gotcha so these are this is our little display case of some of the instruments that we worked on and this one over here that guy right there um, I'll talk about a little bit later but it's kind of the one that's going to Jupiter um, the one that's going to Jupiter has not really been built yet there's a, a, a they build a, a bunch of models um, but they definitely build an engineering model um, this is kind of the prototype and then they'll build a flight model, which is kind of this revered object that nobody, um, that you treat very specially, uh, which is definitely not that one. It would be in a clean room and all sorts of things. All right. Sorry, I'm going to go back to my presentation. So that's that little cover. Um, this is not me in the clean room, but one of the things when we were building this is like, I thought it was really, really cool to go in the clean room until about the 50th or 100th time, and then um, it kind of wears off. But it actually is pretty cool to, to be involved in that type of uh, environment and that mission. Um, oh, one of the other really interesting things that they do here at LASP is if you work on a mission, they actually um, machine your name into one part of it. In fact, this part was the electronics box. You can see all the electronics used in SDC. And there's uh, my name, which I thought was pretty cool. And this is really more than that. It's kind of, in my mind, it's a reminder of um, the fact that we're going out to Pluto and we're doing all this stuff, but it's a very human endeavor. It's really this team that, um, and, and for us, it was a team of students. It was a very um, interesting and, and learning experience for all of us, but it's kind of this, uh, it's a really tight group that does this, and you really get to know each other, and it's just this awesome experience, and, and this always reminds me of um, kind of how this is more of a human endeavor than really the, the, the science that we get back from it. Um, so anyway, this is a cool picture, I thought. Um, this is our launch. So we launched from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the fairing that I showed earlier where the uh, instrument is, that's that white part at the top. It's like a little egg, and once it gets high enough, that egg opens. Um, you have the solid rocket boosters. This, this was actually an Atlas V, um, which is a few hundred feet tall. Um, so that's what you're looking at. In fact, you can see buildings down at the bottom. Um, so that gives you kind of a, a size perspective. And we did this on such a big rocket because we wanted to, uh, and we built this very small spacecraft to give us, uh, well, the fastest thing ever launched. Um, that's how we did it, was with a massive rocket and a very small object. Um, this is a video, and we can go through the, I don't know if you can hear the sound, but um, this is a video of our launch, and it's kind of cool because it shows the separation um, and, and kind of the excitement building up to it. It's only a two minutes, so I'll just... Show it. If you can't hear it, let me know and I'll crank it up. T minus 45 seconds. Can you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, all right. Minus 40 seconds. So this Stay is a really cool three. feeling in my life to know that something I built is sitting right there behind that NASA logo. <laughs> minus 29 seconds. Dallas locked. CS reduced for launch. Roger. 25 seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Those towers are actually to keep lightning away. So if you have a storm while it's out on the pad, T minus 18. it strikes those towers. People always ask what they're 15 for. seconds. 11. 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have ignition and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on a decade voyage to visit the planet Pluto and then beyond. So I actually scrubbed this launch a couple times due to a power failure in, the, in Maryland. And then the, to look good. They had the some five vehicle climbs away from Florida's east coast. The five solid rocket strap-on boosters are burning just fine, sending the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to the very edge of our solar system. So I'll show this a little bit longer because I think it's really cool. There's a, plus 35 seconds. You have a bunch of stages, and in ours we had three. And it'll show the two stages with the solid rocket boosters. I'll show them fall away at the very end, and you'll see the, the middle stage light up. Um, and then they'll go retrieve those solid rocket boosters, and then it'll, it'll go on its way. The egg opens at the very top. That thing opens up when you get high enough that there's no atmosphere and lets our spacecraft out. And then there's a third final stage that One it burns for a little bit. So here soon you'll see these um, solid rocket boosters get a little bit dimmer and you'll see in the middle there's a bright light that starts to light up and that's that central second stage uh, rocket. And then you'll see the solid rocket boosters fall away. And this will be four is burning out and all chamber persons are responding. So you can see the second stage start to ignite and then soon you'll see those uh, boosters fall out. And we have Boda. Party 180 is throwing up to 100% thrust. T plus one minute, 45 seconds. Everything we continues to look good. Solids one, two. Boost is now just jettisoned. Five, solid separation looks good. There we go. That was a pretty, pretty good feeling. Main stage still running fine. And that's about the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's not true. The movie went on for quite a while after. And... <laughs> So this was actually out of Maryland where they are controlling the spacecraft. Um, in, in July, there was a big um, kind of uh, get-together where all the people um, working on the, on the, the um, spacecraft um, came together and they, um, you know, they were analyzing the data as it came back, making sure the instrument was healthy. And if you followed it all, right before the encounter, they had a big anomaly where the spacecraft, you know, it, it tells you, hey, look, everything's looking good, it's looking good, it's called a green light. And it sends back this red light and it's like, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. This is the worst time ever. Um, so like day and night, these people, I wasn't part of the mission ops, but day and night, the mission ops team worked to figure out what this was. Um, and they solved it literally with about 12 hours to go before we had our final approach. So it was kind of a, that was kind of a cool and, um, time is to really be uh, kind of on the outside, but part of that team as well. So anyway, we made it to Pluto. This actually on the, uh, I'm on the right. The guy on the left is Marcus, who's the current student working on the, uh, the New Horizons project. And there will be, this project will go on now. They found out, or they hope that it'll go on to about 2025 and beyond. So this is a very, very long life project. Um, and we're actually looking for a student right now to um, take over. So um, this is uh, some SDC results. This is very, this is actually an old slide. Um, but uh, what it shows is, um, we are, uh, as you can see, this is the dust flux, so you don't have to worry about the units, but the higher these, um, these uh, points are, the more flux we're getting per day. And, and on the bottom is just how far, we are, how far away we are from the sun. And you can see that as we go increase out toward the sun, if you remember that plot with those uh, bright lobes of when you're an alien looking in, um, you should see more dust as you go out because it starts in the Kuiper belt, it spirals in, and it gets collected by all these planets. So the further in you are, the more chance it's had to be collected by a planet. And so this shows a small um, rise as you go out of the solar system. We actually have more days now. I just haven't put it in this. But um, this is kind of some of the first SGC results. Um, there is, in general, uh, for New Horizons, besides SDC, there's a lot of science. And we chose to put, when we launched this, we had two options. We could put our money in the um, transmitting data back to Earth or storing it on the spacecraft and transmitting it back slowly. And that's what we chose, is to take a lot more data, store it on the space spacecraft, and send it back over the course of, the, of a full year. So that happened in July, and we haven't even gotten half of our science back because the transmission rate is so low. 
we have to get time on the DSN, which is a deep space network. Um, but there's data coming back all the time. If you go visit um, the New Horizons website, it's just, hey, here's what we saw six months ago. Hey, here's what we saw six months ago. Um, <laughs> and so this is, this is actually one of the cool images. Um, Pluto has a lot of things. Uh, the whale's tail, I don't know if you can see it on the left, it kind of looks like that. And when they came out, people said it kind of looked like a heart. Um, but what they found recently, and this is a few weeks ago, um, that they have water ice on Pluto, actually, so, which is a, a very interesting find. In fact, they think that all of the craters in the mountains are actually not rock, but it's water ice, um, which at that temperature, uh, Pluto's so far out, it's very, very cold. It behaves like a rock. It's just super solid. Um, you also see these smooth spots on the right, and they think that that's flow of either nitrogen or methane ice. Um, mm -hmm. So Pluto is actually very, very interesting. I think if you got together uh, top 20 scientists who study the outer planets, they probably wouldn't have said this is what we'll find in Pluto. Um, so it's been very exciting to, to be a small part of it, I'll say. Uh, the lunar dust experiment. Um, we also recently sent a mission to the moon. Um, and this mission was a pretty small mission. It had four uh, science packages on it, and we were fortunate to be one of those, the lunar dust experiment. Um, so what we did was we flew around the moon for 100 days. And imagine that on the moon, um, you have a big meteor coming in. It slams into the surface of the moon. So on the bottom of that, you have the, on the bottom left, you have the moon's surface. There's a large impactor, which is that dotted line, and it just scatters all this smaller dust into the atmosphere. Well, eventually that will come back down, but there's so many impacts going on. Even if they're small, if they're like micron size impacts or, or you know, half a millimeter size impacts, they create all this dust. And so much so, what we found when we were out there is there's actually a cloud of dust that hangs around the moon. Um, and so we fly through that dust at about two kilometers per second, which was our orbiting velocity over the moon. And we, send sig and we get signals when that dust impacts our target. So you can see the dust coming in, it produces electrons and ions. We have an electric field that separates them out. And so we detect the ions and we tell you, hey, based on this amount of ions, this is how big the particle was and we know where it occurred because of you know, where the spacecraft is. So this was our goal is to look at the, um, the dust cloud around the moon. And people thought it wouldn't even be there or some people thought it would be um, you know, very smooth or whatever. And so that's what we were going out to investigate. Let's say you put a per person on the moon, you definitely wanna know how much dust is out there and how many of these um, uh, meteors are coming in. Oh, well, let's say we put a, moon, a man on the moon again. <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a picture of LDEX. This is not very big. It's about the size of a, uh, to be cliche, a bread box. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a very small instrument. There's a, a door on the front that's closed right now, but that pops open. It's actually got a zip tie. You can see it's holding it shut right now. That doesn't happen. We, uh, in space, we don't have the zip tie. Um, <laughs> so... This is our instrument. Um, it launched on a Minotaur 5, and I actually did get to see uh, this launch from Maryland. Um, it was a night launch. This is actually 11 uh, p.m. at night, um, but it's just lit up because of all the light from the rocket. Um, so this is in Maryland. We all, it, was, uh, it was kind of a cool launch because you could see it all up and down the East Coast. This is actually from New York. You could still see it. Um, and this is, actually, this is a photo I didn't take, but uh, it was one of the coolest ones that I saw. <clears throat> and I'm going to go forward a few times. This is probably how you know of about our launch. If you saw in the news that NASA launched a frog, um, this was our launch. So this, this rocket was where we had our instrument in there and kind of got famous because there's a picture of a frog that was getting uh, launched from the, uh, the, the thruster. <laughs> um, so to go back a couple, this was actually what we put in. Uh, we, we wrote a paper about the asymmetric um, dust cloud around the moon. And so this was one of our, um, our nature... Uh, um, publications and you can see that <clears throat> it shows all of our orbits around the moon we we didn't have a, it was a very very short or uh, mission it was only a hundred days um, but during the day we, we orbited the, the moon multiple times and so we were able to build up a story of how this dust is behaving around the moon and um, what you can see here is the red parts are where there's a lot of dust and then you can see a tail off to um, basically no dust around the backside and this plot shows a similar sort of thing and what you have is the brighter the color, um, the more dust you see. So LDEX flew around the moon, and there's a black section in the bottom left where we had to turn off because we would face the sun and we can't do that. But barring, you know, despite that, what we see is this asymmetry. So in the direction of the moon's travel, which is up, it actually, we see more dust. 
And you can kind of imagine this as making sense because imagine you're traveling through a dust cloud at a very high velocity. Well, those are going to impact you and then create the secondary cloud that we fly through. So that's what we actually discovered is there's a dust cloud around the moon, but it's asymmetry. It's asymmetric and it's, it's preferentially located in the direction of travel of the moon. Uh, there's the frog shot. Uh, at the end of our mission, um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't stay orbiting around the moon. We didn't come back. Um, we actually crashed, if you will, or deorbited, as people like to call it. Uh, and, and so um, we actually knew this was going to happen. People say, oh, I'm sorry. And we're like, no, no, it's fine. It's, um, it's what was planned. So we knew this was going to happen five years ago. But this is a cool picture. This is taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is orbiting the moon right now. And so you can see that they took a picture, and then a few days later, they took a picture of the same spot. And so that's the Laddie impact location. So the, the instrument I worked on is now a, a heap of metal on the moon. But somewhere on there is my name. <laughs> um, I think I have one more slide on. Oh, no. So that was our Lottie uh, mission. And the last thing I'll talk about is a future mission to Europa, which is really big in our lab. We got selected a few months ago, and we've been working like crazy to get it out the door. Um, not get it out the door, to get it started. It doesn't launch until 2025. So we haven't even started building the engineering model. We're only in the prototype phase. And so actually the prototype's just down the hall, but um, it's in a clean room, so I can't really bring it out and show you. <laughs> I, I thought about doing it, but then I was like, eh. <laughs> um, but uh, you can kind of, anyway, I'll show you. So what is this mission? This mission is going to Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. And one of the big challenges about this is it's in a very, Jupiter has a very high radiation environment. Um, a human wouldn't last a few seconds around uh, if you're at Io. Um, or sorry, at yeah, Europa. Um, there's, it's a very, very high radiation environment and so high that the instruments are very concerned about it. That's one of the biggest concerns about this mission is how are we going to survive the cameras, the detectors, um, even all the, the plastics that you have, um, the wires, the cabling, how is that going to survive this high radiation environment? And one of the solutions is not to orbit Europa, but to orbit uh, Jupiter at an incline. And so most of the radiation is in, is in a disk um, in a certain plane. And so we actually fly out of that plane for the most, most part, and then we dip inside Europa, we fly by Europa, and we fly immediately back out of that. So that's one of the solutions is to, um, to, to fly by Europa or just to clip it. In fact, the original name of this was called the Europa Clipper. Um, but that's one of the challenges of this mission. Uh, one of the major goals of this mission is to uh, find life. Um, I don't know if you guys, does anybody out there play StarCraft? Oh, yes. oh yeah. <laughs> So you know what the Zerg are, and uh, um, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> good. Uh, well, we have a lot of people here who also know what the Zerg are. Um, it turns out that that's not quite what we're doing. It really is what we're doing is we're this mission specifically is um, going to find habitats. So not necessarily life. Hey, if we find it, that'd be great. Um, but we're really looking for a habitable world. Is Europa habitable? Um, and so I have a picture here. I have two pictures here. One of them is Europa and one of them is Zerg Creek. Can you identify which one's which? The left or the right is Europa? Right. The right is Zerg Creek and the left is Europa. Um, <laughs> and it's kind, of a funny, it's kind of a funny thing, but the purpose of this is Europa is very, very diverse. It does not look like the moon. It does not look like the, um, like, uh, even, even Jupiter. It doesn't look like that. What Europa actually is, is it's some sort of, some amount of ice, and there's a debate as to how much that is. Let's say it's a kilometer of ice, and then below that, there's a subsurface ocean. And hopefully, or not hopefully, but maybe it's a salty ocean. Um, and there's a good chance that um, it's, it's a very habitable world. And so that's one of the things we're going to go out and explore is, um, what does this subsurface ocean look like? And what does the ice look like? Um, so that's one of the goals of this mission is to really say, how does this habitat look? Um, but again, it's very diverse. If you were a person designing a computer game and you wanted to do uh, an alien world, you can almost um, put, put Europa out there. Uh, I have about eight more minutes that I can um, be here, and then I'm going to take questions. So I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly. But this is Europa. This is Suda um, flying over Europa. And again, what happens is these particles come in, they slam into the ice, and they produce this ejecta that flies off of the surface of Europa. And that's what we collect. And we are a mass spectrometer. So uh, this is me. Actually, that's the prototype right there in the dust chamber. Um, I won't talk about this very much, but 
Uh, a mass spectrometer is, is a, there's a couple ways to do this. Ours is a time of flight. So you impact a target and you separate it into all of its constituents, carbon, oxygen, helium, hydrogen, whatever's there. And you put it across a big electric field. Um, mm -hmm. Ours reflects it back down. And what you have is um, the, the lighter elements get there first and the heavier elements get there a little bit later. And from that, you can actually build up a spectrum of what your particle consists of. Is it water? Is it carbon? Um, so this is, I showed this earlier, but this is a, a particle impacting ice in our lab. And so this is one of the things that maybe we will find out there is this, um, these uh, water clusters. Um, and then maybe, you know, if we're lucky, we'll find some, some, uh, uh, some more complex um, compounds that you know suggest maybe there's a, it's even greater potential for having having life or maybe salts one of the way you get salts is to um to be an ocean is in contact with a rocky core that's why the, the earth has salt in its ocean um so maybe europa has a rocky core and you get all these salts out of that so there are a lot of questions um that we're gonna hopefully answer when we fly out there um and we also kind of a fun lab we do a lot of social sciences um, this is our lab you can see on the right is the uh, accelerator and we have recently installed a fairly large screen TV, and we, uh, I don't know, possibly play Mario Kart there. Uh, <laughs> really, uh, a fun, uh, um, without the paintball um, shooting range. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun place to work, um, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, listen to me. All right. David, that was fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's really weird not to be able to see you guys. So it's kind of like I'm giving a presentation. I'm like, you know, they could have gone. I flipped back to the screen. There's nobody there. <laughs> so I'm glad you stuck with it. Oh, yeah. We'll switch you back over to where we can see you. Yeah. This is, this is where people say, oh, you can do all this stuff, but you can't even work Google. <laughs> So I want to definitely open it up to questions. If anyone is watching online, uh, we're using the Q&A feature on the Google Hangout, or I'll be watching the uh, GHO seminar hashtag on Twitter. Uh, feel free to use those. I'll try to pay attention and catch those. Uh, do we have any questions here from our local audience? Caleb in the back. OK, so those detectors that you had were about the size of the dollar bill. Um, yeah, were those, those, um, on the student dollar. Yeah, were those one-shot detectors, like once they give you a signal, they're dead, or can they be reused? That's a great question. Um, on Pioneer, they actually had one-shot detectors, and what they were were these cans that when they punctured through, it released this gas, and so there was no longer pressure. Um, so they only had like 18 of these. But ours, um, student dust counter, is multi-shot. Um, you can spatter this with a million particles, and it'll still work. Uh, the only thing that matters is if for some reason you get a short across the front and the back and they're very very thin They're only 28 microns thick, so they're very thin. Um, they feel kind of like saran wrap actually um, But if you get a short across there, then it doesn't work We think there may have been that on one of these detectors uh, detector number 13 But in general no, they'll, they'll work for multiple impacts. So we've gotten thousands uh, of impact well, uh, Hundreds of impacts throughout the mission Cool. Good what, question. You have one? Um, so at the very beginning, you were showing uh, that uh, the lenses and stuff would be damaged by the dust particles flying into them. And it, it looked to me like it, would, it had some pretty serious impact after you said that that's fine. So what, where do you cut off uh, damaged versus not damaged? Like obviously you're not going to make it impenetrable, otherwise it would be unusable. But so where Yeah. So it, de it depends on what you're – so there was a radiator impact that I showed earlier on the shuttle. Um, and so that's a very human size damage, right? But all sorts of particles, even if you're a nanometer size, you, you can, uh, we're actually gonna do an experiment with um, somebody, one of these companies who does protection for lithography. And with their, they have these very, very thin uh, films. And so damage to them is only a few nanometers that they're gonna hit it with uh, these tens, 20 size, nanometer size particles. And it may actually shatter those teeth. So um, very, so one side of that is, it depends on what your scale you're looking at. Uh, detectors can be sensitive to different sized impacts. Obviously, most things, our spacecraft, um, New Horizons, if it gets hit by a grain of rice sized particle, it's end of mission. The whole mission, depending on where it gets hit, but most anywhere it hits on the spacecraft, we're done. If we get hit by a grain of rice, um, because it's moving so fast. Um, typically, though, uh, you're okay at 
tens, tens of microns. Um, you, you know, again, it depends on what you're looking at. Um, but what we deal with is tens of microns, and normally you're okay with a few, with a shot or two. Uh, the problem is when you start building it up and you get a, either a haze or you hit on just the wrong part of a wire, um, you get a short or a, a sudden burst of uh, electrons. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers your question, but it really depends on what size you're talking about. <laughs> and if you're the moon, you can sustain up to, you know, a few kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> David, switch over to uh, some of those schematics that show the uh, detectors with the electric fields and how the particles Move. All right, so we got two of them. We have, oh, we have three, but um, let me see if uh, oh, I close my presentation. I actually think I closed my presentation. <laughs> um, let me uh, open that back up. Um, you guys. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a couple of them. This is Suda. Um, so that's the time of flight mass spectrometer. This is the one that just, this is LDEX, which just measures uh, the total mass of the particle. That, that one right there. That one right there. Yeah, so, so is, that, is that a, a, a spherical, a hemispherical yes. electric field? It's a hemispherical um, target. It's actually coated in rhodium, which is a, um, a very unique metal. Um, the reason it's a hemisphere is not because we want it to be for the, the dust, but because we don't want light to Im to shine onto our detector. Um, so what this does is any light um, photon that comes in, it actually gets reflected out away from our detector. So that's why we have a hemisphere here. Um, it just so happens that um, uh, we need that, and, and I mean we prefer a flat target there. <laughs> but uh, but well, yes, yeah, so the hemisphere. What I, what I like about that is it's beautiful. That to me, when you look at that, it reminds me of UP two, right? That's of what. That's uh, UP2. <laughs> yeah. Right? When you're doing uh, those yeah. Gauss's law problems, you think this is ridiculous. There's never going to be a situation where I could use that much symmetry to solve a problem. And here you have a uh, electric field that's radial, right? Absolutely. And you're you're so well, okay. Here, boom! I've got ions and I've got little chunks of uh, other stuff. Where are they going to go? Absolutely. And it's, it's just a beautiful example of that basic freshman level physics that is right there in that detector. That's gorgeous. You know, most things that you work on really go back to about UP2, uh, UP3 ideas. The yeah. little, the devil's in the details, but most yeah. things, most high level um, instruments operate on those those type of principles, on that level. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. Every day I um, have to use um, that, that level of, uh, of physics, for sure. So yeah, but it's very simple. The electric field points one way, the ions go that way, and the electrons go the other. It's Newton's second. It's gorgeous. Yeah. So, so you're an alumni of uh, UCA. So you were born in Arkansas. You grew up here. You came to UCA, uh, got your undergrad degree, uh, and then you launched yourself out. And it sounded like from your beginning uh, kind of background, you talked about how the REU really helped you uh, figure out what you wanted to do and where you ended up. What, what sort of background or advice might you give the current undergrads if you could you know, think of something that you might tell them that would help them with figuring out what path to follow? Uh, I would say there's a lot of things. One of them is that um, I was sitting right where you are. I took classes in that room. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's – um, and, I, you know, I, there's a lot of places you could end up, but I really, really enjoy what I'm doing. And, and it's really out there. Um, it, it's out there for you to take if you want it. Um, that kind of sounds cliche, but again, you know, I, I was sitting right where you guys were. Um, I was in SPS. Uh, Galen Ross, he was not there anymore, I guess. But um, yeah, uh, Dr. Fred was my advisor. Um, and so one of the things that really did help me, though, if I were to give a concrete piece of advice, um, REUs or research experience for undergraduates are really important. They're important for a lot of reasons. One of them is um, they're fun as heck. I mean, I had a great summer when I did this. Um, it, you know, Colorado's amazing, but all these other places are too, so I'm not trying to um, say just apply here if you want to do it. Um, also, you make connections. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I think that I got in here is because um, I, I knew some of the professors here. Um, I also learned what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, I didn't really know that I wanted to go to grad school when I did it, um, and it really kind of said, you know, this is this is fun stuff. So 
Um, and REU was very uh, helpful to me. Also, research at, at, at UCA, uh, no matter what level it is. Um, I, I, like I said, I did a little bit of research with uh, Dr. Fredrickson, but um, it was extremely helpful. I, I really learned a lot from that, and it's just these little ideas um, that you take. Uh, programming is also one of the things that I would suggest if you can get into that. Um, that's one of the things that I wish I'd have done a little bit more um, mm -hmm. as another concrete example, but because um, they, you know, if you're going to be a data, if you're going to be a physicist, you're going to use data analysis um, and programming. So hopefully I answered your question, Will, but um, yeah, I think the main point is that um, go out there and get it if you want it. <laughs> uh, did you feel like your, um, your other experiences, your coursework and your uh, other experiences here at UCA prepared you well for grad school? Uh, yeah, I, I think that you get a diverse range of people. Um, I had a bit of a struggle, but it was for a different reason. I actually took a year off and went to teach in China. Uh, so I came back and I hadn't done physics in a year. <laughs> and I think that's really, that, that really was hard for me. Um, I'm glad I did it and I would do it again, but I probably would have, um, in between China and grad school, I probably should have studied a little bit more physics before jumping in. Cause I got, I got hit upside the head when I came in, but, um, that wasn't because of school. It was because of that. Um, I thought my classes at UCA, like I said, there was a few things that I would do differently. I would start programming more. Um, I didn't really know how to program very well. Um, I learned a little bit in Dr. Fred's, but um, I think that, that was an important thing. Um, but, you, you know, you, you meet all sorts of uh, people who come in from small schools all over, from big schools all over. Even, you know, it doesn't really matter if you go to a small or big school. It's, it's what you put in there. So, Cool. Cool. You guys have any other questions? Well, this has been fantastic, David. We really appreciate your time. I'm um, glad you do. I appreciate it. We, we, we really like doing these seminars, especially with someone like you who's, who's familiar with us and knows kind of what the students are like here. Uh, but it's great to bring in someone uh, like yourself to give a seminar that we normally would never get to hear about. So thank you very much for your time. I know you've got a uh, prior commitment, but appreciate your time this evening, and thank you again. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I really do appreciate it, and uh, best of luck to all you guys. All right. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you.